all of our speakers on the next panel represent some of the best R&D leaders and chief scientists. Plus, they all show that there is indeed this crossover and this convergence of science and discovery in the ag biosciences. So I'd now like to introduce another friend and colleague, David Broker, who will serve as the moderator for our panel. David is a seasoned life sciences executive and I would say a serial entrepreneur. He started his career at Eli Lilly, has led multiple startups, and was instrumental in launching the Indiana Biosciences Research Institute. He well understands the multidisciplinary opportunities in research and scientific discovery, and so I think is extremely well suited to lead this conversation. Please join me in welcoming David to the stage who will introduce our panelists. You have to dance or something with <laughs> Thank you. Here, come on up. Um, I'm going to ask the panelists to come, come, come on up in the spirit of saving a little bit of time and, and creating time for questions at the end. Uh, thank you, Beth, for that, that kind introduction. Uh, you know, I, uh, as Beth alluded to, I started my career at Eli Lilly and Company. You said seasoned, so seasoned years ago. Uh, and Lilly at that time, it was a fantastic company. And you think of the impact that that has had on the state. When I was there, it was an animal health company, still is, an agro-science company, uh, a medical device set of companies, the biotech pharmaceutical business, as well as then Elizabeth Arden, the cosmetic uh, company. I didn't have the face for the Elizabeth Arden uh, business unit, but I got an opportunity as a young engineer to work in all of those different areas of Eli Lilly and Company. And when you think about Indiana, and you'll, you'll, you'll learn this very, very quickly from this distinguished group, Indiana is really a leader, I would, I would argue the leader in the diversity of life sciences in the country, if not the world. Um, a lot of people like to talk about Boston, a lot of people like to talk about Minneapolis as the med tech capital of the world. Everybody likes to talk about the Bay Area, San Francisco, Silicon Valley. But when you look at Indiana and you think about the fact that we have one of everything from agricultural companies to animal health companies to life science, uh, medical device and pharmaceutical, and importantly, and as you already started to see, a set of technology companies. So this convergence is happening in our state. The Lieutenant Governor talked about the impact of life sciences on the ag side, and she quoted a number, I think of what, 30 some billion dollars. But if you add it up across all the other life science companies uh, and industries, it's over $62 billion. And it ranks us number two in the country in terms of exports, because we're still a state that likes to make things. So when you think about the economic impact of all of that terrific science and innovation and manufacturing and commercialization that's happening here in the state of Indiana, it's just incredible and, and really fantastic. And so it's our panel, switch now to Sunny outline many of the problems, challenges. I think now you're gonna learn from some of these distinguished scientists and engineers and business people what some of the opportunities are in terms of innovations and things like that. So the way we're gonna run this panel is each of the speakers uh, has about five minutes, six minutes. Uh, they've prepared just two or three slides to kind of highlight their organization and some of the ideas and innovations and opportunities that they see for the future. So that'll take about half of the time, hopefully. And we really want to spend then the second half of the time engaging in a discussion amongst our panelists and particularly with our audience. So our first panelist uh, is uh, Aaron Schott. Aaron is the Vice President for Global R&D and Regulatory Affairs for Elanco, which is the animal health business within Eli Lilly and Company. Elanco is a top three, two? Top four, top four company when it comes to animal health. So uh, we're, we're pleased to have Aaron join us and kick things off. Thank you. Can I get the, uh, the clicker there? Dave? You need, okay. Yeah. Well, it's a privilege to be here and, and what a great um, summit and a great panel that I get to be a part of and, and happy to be a sponsor as part of Elanco. Um, let me talk a little bit about um, our lens and view of the problem uh, and the opportunity space in animal health. As we think about Elanco's mission, first of all, we focus both on food animal livestock, um, as well as companion animals, and are, are, are really motivated by innovating uh, for the customers who care for those uh, animals uh, in significant ways. But if we focus our attention on food animal, I highlight here a bit of a journey of the food animal 
uh, situation and the livestock production environment, where in essence we see a, um, a system that actually cares about the introduction of new animals into the world all the way through weaning, ultimately through a growing phase, and then through a processing phase. We um, think about animal health starting with the, the reproduction cycle, ending with the, uh, the entry into the food chain as part of what we um, uh, stand to deliver innovation against the notable problems. And I highlight the problems on this slide in a, in a way that um, Dr. Ramaswani highlighted. There are key losses in this value chain at every step along the way any infertility or any lack of, of being able to, to get a, a, a reproductive um, gain uh, in the livestock population is a loss. Any, any um, improper weaning or any stress or disease that gets experienced by a young animal sets that animal up to not grow as well as one that doesn't experience that. Any animal that's not fed and, and uh, um, given the proper nutrition as it's entering the growing phase doesn't, doesn't reach its full genetic potential to deliver as much meat, milk, or eggs as it could. Uh, any any um, issue with how we process and ultimately um, harvest the livestock uh, results in loss. And then post entry into the food chain, I think you can understand there are lots of waste uh, um, aspects that have nothing to do with the animal's health anymore. Uh, but certainly could be addressed uh, through uh, the way we think about innovation going forward. So we care about all of these steps, and you can see the numbers here highlight great opportunity to realize much fuller um, economic potential than we realize today in terms of livestock production. Um, this next slide tries to highlight in a very simple way really something that Dr. Ramaswamy did a much better job with, and that's, the, that's all of the key advances in technology that are really setting up this powerful and amazing convergence of new technology uh, either driving innovation directly or catalyzing innovation uh, in very powerful ways. And I just highlight a few um, aspects of the technology. I think these were all represented in some of the ideas from Dr. Ramaswani, so I won't go further. But in terms of these then translating into what are disruptive um, opportunities in, in, in animal health, food animal health, we see obviously genetics and how we manage those or gene editing and how we instill new traits into animals. As, as something that could result in, in fact, there's early evidence that suggests it's possible that we could make animals disease-free or disease-resistant, sort of edit out the bad things and edit in good things uh, after the animal's born. So they're not we're gen genetically modifying at the germ level, but addressing something that's more um, in line with the, the living process of the animal. Precision uh, agriculture and smart farms, the ability to know exactly uh, what to anticipate to predict um, animal production gains more effectively, makes for more efficient use of resources. Uh, connecting animals to instruments, sensors, and then connecting them to the internet give us great potential to really know what's going on in the life of that animal. And I'll talk about where that translates in my final slide as a provocative. And then finally, uh, this is more of a disruptive threat to my business, synthetic protein. If all of a sudden we can make um, uh, meat protein or uh, egg protein or milk proteins as a source through synthetic means, we don't need animals anymore. Uh, I don't believe in that future anytime soon, but certainly it's a trend and we see uh, venture investment in this space uh, driving towards that and there's consumer interest in that. So finally, just uh, you know, dating back to the first slide and thinking about what now the challenge is for a livestock producer, they have to pay attention to all of the variables at the bottom of this page. and They really manage a system where these, these variables interrelate. Uh, and frankly, more and more as time has gone on, these variables have become more transparent to consumers than they ever have been. Consumers care more about these things than they ever have. And so that's leading to an evolution of an expectation uh, around what a food label is. And so that becomes a new dynamic that we have to be responsive to and pay attention to as innovators in animal health for how do we address customers and ultimately consumers' concerns about what's in the food. Uh, and so this is a, uh, uh, just a, a vision, it's probably a near-term uh, uh, change that's going to happen where when I go to buy food in the marketplace, I can actually scan some code and I can find out, as Wired has, has depicted, that there's a lot more information available to me than I ever knew about and that I care about how this food was produced on a, on a number of different scales and levels, not just how fresh is it, but how was it fed, how was it watered, how was it treated with medicines. Um, how, how does that farming operation treat the environment? 
So these are all aspects that consumers can make, care more and more about. These are all aspects that become more available as the data about how we raise livestock become available and integrated and usable. And frankly, I think this is, uh, you know, ultimately, it may well be the case where you scan that food and you find exactly the, the electronic medical record of the animal, right, that you intend to uh, make into, you know, chicken cacciatore or the milk that you intend to pour over your cereal. So um, we, we know the world is going this way. Not every consumer wants all that information, but for the ones that do, I think we're gonna have to make it available. And the practices then that support livestock production in light of this are gonna have to change and evolve. Right. And we think carefully about that at Elanco uh, going forward. But it's an exciting time for innovation, not a threatening time in my view. Great, Thank thanks Aaron. I'm gonna skip to the end. Tyler Foxbury is the uh, chief scientist of a company called Demand Jump. Uh, he is an applied data science. We're going to go from biology mm -hmm. to, the, to the far end here in terms of data and data science uh, and some of the things that we've been, been hearing about. Um, maybe give some opening comments um, um, on, on how you see things, uh, how you've entered this space perhaps uh, to get things going. Absolutely. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Very good. So, you know, when most people think of, of artificial intelligence, um, I think that there's sort of two diverging patterns that people uh, think of. One is the matrix or the terminator kind of, uh, kind of uh, outcome, which is, you know, frankly, very hyperbolic and not re necessarily representative of where uh, the technology is today or even where it is within in the foreseeable future. The other side of AI is far more ubiquitous um, and also more or less fades into the background. Um, we think about all the technologies that, um, that power daily life. Social, you know, social media, um, you know, the markets, um, our cell phones, everything, you know, there is a component of artificial intelligence that that lies under that lies underneath all of these um, all of these technologies. Um, you know, there's a there's a famous quote from uh, Friedrich Gauss, who's a mathematician in the 18th century, who said that um, you know mathematics is the queen and servant of science. I think that artificial intelligence or machine learning, as I li I like to call it, is the queen and servant of technology that it both um, can motivate new technologies and new applications, um, but it also um, can enhance um, existing, existing technologies. As far as um, you know, how I got into, this, got into this field, I came from um, a mathematics background and a neuroscience background and, and really focused on understanding the structure and function of, um, of how you know, the brain learns. And I circuitously went from that to uh, working in biotech and problems in uh, genomics and mass spectrometry, and then found myself working in, um, in management consulting and traveling around the country and working on problems ranging from you know, um, algorithmic trading to fraud detection to public health. And um, in the last two years, I made a transition to uh, help uh, uh, form a startup um, that's focusing in the um, uh, marketing automation <laughs> space. And you know, drawing back into my roots and understanding the, comp um, the study in mathematics of complex networks to help understand and model markets online. And I think that's really where, um, when I think about where data science AI is going into the future, that um, you know, the more you know, commonplace examples of, of machine learning and the types of things that students will see in, class in classrooms or in graduate coursework is really just variations on a theme of, let's say we have pictures of apples and oranges. Well, we can design an algorithms and there are many ways you can skin a cat here, but it ultimately boils down to, can I automate the process of classifying, is this picture an apple, is this an orange? And then we can generalize into things like forecasting and other types of optimization processes such as, you know, how do I balance <coughs> my, let's say, how do I balance my investments across a pool of risky stocks using the signals and data that we have available to us coupled with mathematical techniques. But where the future, I believe, is heading is understanding the, um, sort of the merger of, um, of complex networks such as the internet, such as our economy, such as supply chains, food chains, and the instrumentation of all of those complex um, you know, processes with machine learning. Because historically, those two fields have been um, not necessarily um, compatible because the machinery of traditional machine learning does not um, necessarily jive well with um, the types of structures that are, um, that are in place for studying complex networks. And so the research that, um, that my team and, and I have been um, endeavoring over the last several years is, is looking at the marriage of these two things so that we can you know, solve complex problems such as, you know, how do we allocate resources across complex networks? How do we identify anomalies in complex networks? And how do we forecast changes in the structure and function of networks over time? 
That's great. That's great. There's lots to get into uh, yeah. during the Q&A. Uh, Ali, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Ali Shakura. He's the director of the Burke Nanotechnology Center at Purdue University. He's also a professor of electrical and computer engineering. Your expertise seems to be in figuring out how to use heat to generate electricity, as well as sensors and the whole Internet of Things. Uh, welcome, and, and what kind of opening thoughts do you have for the group? Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I guess uh, I come from the direction of where the technology have had a major impact in communications and, com and computing. Uh, the graph here is one of these uh, singularity graphs, shows what have happened. All of us know how much computing power and communication power have increased. In year 1960, we had uh, one million um, mainframe computers. In 92, we reached 100 million PCs, and today we have um, close to a couple of billion connected uh, devices, and all of us are using that. Um, one uh, building block that really helped all of this happen is the silicon ICs, and everybody now is talking, future is about internet of things. What we learn about things and what we can do with that information. Um, one of the areas that we are considering is what is uh, about internet of things, there is an internet, which is the virtual world, but the thing part of it you need to connect the physical world, and I think that's an area where Indiana could make a difference. You know, Silicon Valley and Boston could own virtual world. At the end, you need to make things or grow things, mm -hmm. and how you bring information and the things together, that's what is hard. Um, one, one of the areas we looked at analogy with, with Silicon is this common platform that can tell us about things does not exist. What we can do in that area, if here is an example, you want to know, uh, uh, you saw what you can do with drones, with satellites, but you also want to know what happens in the soil. At the end, the plants grow in the soil. Do we have ways to measure activities, nutrients, pesticides in the soil, provide the information? On the other spectrum, it's something that you heard earlier from Sunny is about, about the food. Uh, when do you know the food is fresh? When do you know uh, uh, um, there are problems? And here is interestingly an interesting uh, convergence, what happens with the health sciences. Um, um, with uh, type of sensors, we can actually study what happens in the sweat, and based on that, uh, know better about uh, what is inside your body and maybe control some of the drug release. So there's a lot of work about a discussion about digital health and also digital ag. And I think these are areas where really Indiana could play a key role. That's great. I'd like to turn to Monica now. Uh, Monica Cerebus, she's the project management leader uh, within the agricultural division of DuPont Dow. Uh, she's been here in Indiana for many, many years. Uh, and now she has an opportunity to go to Iowa uh, mm -hmm. and integrate things uh, between the two organizations, but with a real expertise on plant genetics, trait management, those kinds of things. Monica, your early yeah. thoughts? Thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks for so much for, for the opportunity of being part of uh, this uh, phenomenal, phenomenal summit. Uh, but just to step back a little bit of, and talk a little bit about what, you know, what we have done over the last actually months of bringing two of these big companies together, the Dow DuPont uh, company, and as um, uh, Dr. Sonny said this morning, now uh, we are part of the one big, big family. Um, it's been really important to bring these uh, two companies together uh, to, to bring two very complementary portfolios um, that will allow to create actually three uh, world-class independent companies. Uh, you can see here the agricultural division, the material science division, and the specialty products. And of course, I'm gonna focus on the agricultural division. And just to give you a little bit of context, the agricultural division is gonna have about 22,000 employees around the world. Uh, majority of those will be actually working in research, in science, and innovation. But of course, also in marketing, and commercial, and uh, in other areas of the, of the organization. Gonna be part of, uh, or gonna be uh, in more than 130 um, countries. And I think what I uh, wanna say, I feel very proud that there's gonna be two global centers uh, for, for this new company. One will be the Moe in Iowa, but the other one will be here in Indianapolis, in Indiana. So we, have, we feel really, really proud of, uh, proud of that. But we are here to talk about innovation. And the new uh, Dow DuPont innovation um, company will be uh, a global innovation, uh, global innovation leader. Uh, there is going to be a great opportunity of bringing the two uh, uh, companies together from a 
uh, crop protection, biotech, uh, seeds standpoint, and really deliver a very strong pipeline that it will be very balanced, very comprehensive, and very responsible, because it's gonna really address the needs of, uh, of those who produce, which is kind of has been always our core, growers, but I think this is an impo important twist here that I mentioned is that we are gonna also focus on the needs of those who consume. So consumers will be really be a very anchor uh, piece on how we develop our research and how we develop our innovation for future and to secure a few to secure nutrition to future generations, uh, to generations to come. But what we have done or what we are gonna be able to really do out of the gate uh, by bringing these two wonderful companies, uh, companies together is that we're gonna have a very robust uh, pipeline including uh, crop protection uh, products, uh, whether it, be, it is uh, insecticides, uh, uh, herbicides, or really new, new fungicides, or we are gonna be able to work on uh, new genetics and, and bring new biotech uh, traits that are really gonna help, able or help us to uh, support the needs of, of farmers in, uh, you know, around, around the world. Um, that has been our core, and we are gonna also bring uh, you know, expanded services like digital, and, uh, and other areas to be able to provide that better, better service. But as I said, this has been our core, and that's an area that we have been always good at identifying what is the agricultural challenge, what is the need of that particular area, and then go back to our research organization and develop that particular product, whether it is an active ingredient, or it is a new biotech trait, or it is a, a, a new breeding program to deliver genetic gain in a particular crop in a particular area. So that has been our core. But if we really want to make a difference and if we really want to change what we do and, and take agriculture to the next level, we got to focus on, on transformation and on the transformation and innovation, transformational spaces, areas that we don't know what the product is going to look like, areas that are actually very kind of long-term strategic bets that we might, may or may not be able to deliver a product in 15 or 20 years from now. So how we balance that, how we work in the short term uh, uh, in the medium term to deliver those products that are really need, you know, needed by our, for our farmers and, and, and so forth. Balance that with that transformational space, whether it is genome editing, like, and, and in the new company we are gonna be working a lot, probably you heard about CRISPR-Cas uh, technology in several, several areas and, and trying to kind of develop a pretty strong strategy on how we bring products uh, to the marketplace with uh, this genome editing technology or in the biological space or in the uh, microbiome space or in the kind of digital uh, space, not only to serve our products, but also how do we use digital and precision act for uh, conducting our own research to just simply to get to the market faster because you know, we know uh, Mother Nature will always overcome and will always win, so how we can quickly develop new technology to bring uh, these uh, new products to the marketplace as quickly as possible, as efficient as, po as possible to deliver the value, the profitability to the farmer and to serve the needs of our uh, consumers. That's great, thank you, Monica. And then uh, last but not least, my dear colleague, uh, Reiner Fischer, <laughs> Uh, who's now the new CEO uh, and Chief Scientific uh, and Innovation Officer at the Indiana Bioscience Research Institute. Reiner has a tremendous experience across a variety of life science um, innovations and technologies, and Reiner, uh, it's all yours. If I get my slides, thanks. David. Oops. Yeah. So, mm. yeah. So I would like to very quickly share with you a few additional things, what you heard in this morning. So the food and feed supply relies on the growth of our population, which will be by 10 billion in about 30 years from now. But what we have not heard is that we're also losing a lot of the agricultural land. So in the end, the bottom line is that literally in 30 years, we have to increase the productivity at least fourfold. And if you go back into the Green Revolution, in 30 years, Norman Borlaug achieved a 30%, 30% increase in productivity. The question is, what can we do to change this? And the other thing what people always forget is that five major crops that we're eating provide 70% of the daily caloric intake, in some countries even 85%. And the last thing that I would like to address is that 25% or more than 25% of drugs that are on the market are plant-derived molecules. 
So again, how can we better use this in the future? And I'm gonna share with you a few ideas. So this could be the input, the output traits. As Sunny said, I'm gonna skip this very quickly. But ultimately, how can we have healthier products? Mm -hmm. Coming from conventional food, moving towards engineered food, whether they're now called pharma foods, nutraceuticals, uh, or functional. So this is what we need to address in the future better. And there's a lot of key trends that we need to address uh, to literally comply. And again, Sunny has addressed all of this with all the different technologies to all these major uh, crops and staple foods that we're using. So we heard already technology is very important, but unfortunately in this sector, very often we go back to old mm -hmm. conventional breeding technologies mm -hmm. because unfortunately technology has not been accepted. And I will share with you a few examples what we did. Of course, we're working on the zinc finger nucleases or this uh, genome editing. So in my previous life, when I was working for Fraunhofer, we had two technologies where we developed modified starches, literally by uh, accelerated breeding approach, we call it smart breeding, and we also developed dandelion plants to provide a sufficient raw material to make tires. And both products are literally in the market uh, and will be scaled up in the future. Uh, the next thing is to increase productivity, you have to think about how can you do this? And we interfered, and that was already 20 years ago, it took us around 20 years ago, uh, to see two plants where we increased the photosynthetic rate of plants and got almost a duplication in the green biomass. And what you see at the bottom, that we also get almost a threefold increase in the tuber biomass. And this is really what we need if we want to make this fourfold jump in the future. Now, the other thing is, I said, plants make drugs. We can also tailor them to make better drugs. As a matter of fact, we developed in 2006 an animal vaccine in a plant-based system with DAO and made it to the market. Uh, you see here, for example, there's the possibility to use carrot cells to manufacture an enzyme for an enzyme replacement therapy to treat, uh, in this case, Gaucher disease. The product is on the market. And there's currently three platforms that can be used. Single cells, as you see on the left. Uh, so this has been done for manufacturing multiple uh, therapeutics, for example, Texol, and that is manufactured on the 80,000 liter scale in a city close to Hamburg. Then people have used transient system in the middle field, and again, you have been exposed to that. Remember the Ebola case around three years ago. 14,000 people died, and there were no solutions, there were no vaccines, but there were neutralizing antibodies. And a company in California set out to literally develop the cocktail. Kentucky Bioprocessing did the upscale with conventional greenhouses like on the right hand, and they just received around four weeks ago a $300 million plus grant here from the US for stockpiling these protective molecules manufactured in these plant-based systems. And this is really amazing and it's important to have this. And this is done just in conventional greenhouses, but where this is going in the future is what you can see here on the top left, mm -hmm. fully automated greenhouses. We see this in the ornamental field, but we have not really seen this in the pharmaceutical space using plants. Or you have advanced greenhouses or moving to innovative technologies like LED illumination. And with this, we have now increased the yield in the same time spent almost threefold, only by illumination technology combined with the right uh, fertilizers. And ultimately where this is going, you see this a little bit on the right side, a little bit difficult to see, is moving towards technologies called vertical farming. Mm -hmm. Fully integrated systems, in particular in mega cities, where you can have dedicated floors either to an organically grown salad or bell peppers. The next level can be pharma drugs. The next level can be stockpiling for uh, drugs that can be used to treat emergency situations, let's say like the next Ebola and something like this will come. So I'm gonna stop here. You see in the end, by going back into what the plants have, what they can provide, maybe through uh, endogenous healers or uh, people that have used drugs uh, from these plants for thousands of years, uh, but also by converging that with advanced technology, whether this is now automation technology, plus what we heard with the sensor technology before, all the way to artificial intelligence, I think we can do much more with what we have. We have 250,000 plants, we know 50,000 substances, but there's only like uh, around maybe 200 products on the market in the drug space. Mm -hmm. So with this, David, I'm gonna stop. Great, thanks, Reiner. So what we'd like to do is we're going to now open it up uh, for the full audience to participate. Uh, I'm going to start with a few questions to get the ball rolling. But uh, as Beth alluded to, we've got the old-fashioned microphones, which are my preference. Um, 
<laughs> in terms of asking questions. But if you do want to submit questions via Twitter, do so, and they'll come up here, and I'll be able to, to ask the question at that point. So, um, and how much time do we have, Beth? About 20 minutes. Okay, great. So, um, question to uh, Monica and to Aaron to start with. Um, you know, my knowledge and insight into Elanco and into Dow is very biologically focused science, engineering, genetic manipulations, those kinds of things. So historically, that's your scientific strengths and capabilities. How do you work with somebody like Tyler or somebody uh, like Ali when it now is coming with technology and informatics and more mechanical things as opposed to biological things? Uh, how do you guys work together? I mean, is, is collaboration going up, down, staying the same? How do, you, how, do, how do all these things sort of converge together? Aaron, maybe for you to well, start. Maybe, maybe I can start, very, okay. impor very important. So if you think about traditionally uh, what we have done and how we have focused our business traditionally kind of the crop protection uh, space and or the seeds space and when I'm talking about seeds I'm talking about the um, kind of the germplasm development the traditional germplasm development and the biotech uh, input output um, or agronomic traits but how you bring all together how you deliver that uh, service to the farmer absolutely you know it's really instrumental now to engage with digital and kind of the predictive agriculture, whatever we wanna, we wanna call it. So even, even it's so important right now that as part of the new organization, the new company, the new Dow DuPont company, digital is gonna be kind of the, that third pillar. So we're gonna have the crop protection uh, business, the seeds business, and then the digital business or platform or however we wanna call it, because there is that realization that we have to integrate uh, you know, technologies uh, in, in such a way that are going to be really comprehensive and they are gonna be really uh, delivering the value that they are intended to, to, to do that. that. That will be one way to put it out. And then the other way is we really gotta use uh, um, predictive agriculture, digital uh, farming and so forth, not only to deliver that technology, but also on being more efficient internally on how we do our, our science. And, and, and that's gonna be a, a part that definitely is gonna be very important going forward in Circa. Uh, I think it was mentioned by Dr. Sonny is one of the uh, collaborations, partnerships, uh, ownerships that we will have in the new organization. So it's really going to be, you know, fundamental as we go forward. Right, Aaron. Yeah, maybe just to compliment as I think about our um, our capabilities and skill sets, it starts there. Uh, obviously, we're discovery driven, hypothesis driven kind of R and D enterprise. And if you look at what's happened in the actual conduct of life sciences. The, the advent and the, um, the uh, penetration of technology into how we do the work, the automation, the, the large volumes of data, the pattern recognition, those are all parts of techniques we've mastered as scientists. So to think about this now coming to the marketplace is natural for us. I think as it relates to Elanco's journey in this space, if you're gonna work across <laughs> disciplines and boundaries, which is where innovation happens, it really doesn't happen at the center of what you do, it happens at the fringe of what you do, you need people who are pathfinders. Mm -hmm. So we need people at Elanco who actually know mm -hmm. about AI and understand machine learning and complex modeling um, and understand how uh, physical technologies interact with biological technologies. So partnerships with, with Purdue, we've had conversations about uh, automating sensors for animals. Those are exactly where these innovations come from. So first we have to have the fundamental curiosity, which we do. We have to have the pathfinder scientists, which we have, and then we gotta reach out and, mm -hmm. and have relationships with the centers of knowledge that are, are outside of our frame. Right, so Ali, how does that get integrated at a place like Purdue? Uh, you know, um, my mother's side of the family are all farmers down in Poseyville, Indiana, which is the south uh, western tip of the state. Uh, and I've seen the you know increase in technology in their farm fields, but they don't have drones flying around. They don't have sensors in the ground. They're not quite yet to some of these pictures. How does a place like Purdue facilitate um, some of those kinds of things, innovation development? A lot of the advances that have happened in the last 100 years were by focused research in certain areas. And in some sense, we have been very successful. This is how computers have developed. One of the areas we are learning to solve some of these global grand challenges in the food, water, and energy, we really need more dialogue. And part of the dialogue really can happen um, at places where we have all disciplines. You know, companies, of course, they need to focus on certain products, uh, you know, and they need to be in business, and that's what they focus. But as a university, we need to provide an environment mm -hmm. for people to work together. Um, 
there's a lot of language training. It, it kind of people get used to uh, um, certain concept and it's not obvious uh, how others could see it. So um, how to provide that forum. What we feel is the key is uh, to provide real life examples where people work on some certain problems. Because when you actually have a field, and that's some of the work that is happening in collaboration with College of Ag, uh, where on one hand we try to optimize the sensors, we try to optimize the drones, on the other hand you actually far farmers who are developing the plants, things need to work all together. You cannot just optimize one at the same time. Right. So I think this type of um, forums, test beds play a big role. And Tyler, where do you see things from your perspective? And, uh, and, and are you collaborating specifically in the ag space or um, yes, food actually. production space currently? Yeah, well, I'm a scientific advisor for, a, for an ag tech startup called the B, the B Corp down in uh, Bloomington, Indiana, which has um, been a very, uh, very exciting collaboration. And, and when we think about um, you know, the type of sensing and Internet of Things technologies that they're working on, um, plays very naturally into the types of um, you know, network-based anomaly detection and um, you know, structural analysis that, that I've been working on for the last several years. So there's definitely um, you know, a lot of opportunities to, um, to marry you know, the, the latest and greatest with uh, machine learning research with, with ag tech. We're starting to see that. Reiner, put a global perspective on this. Um, you know, you've spent a lot of before here time on the road visiting the other air. countries, um, <laughs> uh, interacting with uh, multiple partners, whether those are ac other academic institutions, industry partners, um, here in the U.S. and now as you've sort of gotten the lay of the land here in Indiana for the last year or so, um, are we ahead, behind? Um, maybe, maybe provide some global perspective. It's a mean question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think in many areas, uh, I think you're uh, ahead. In other areas, I think there's room for improvement. Uh, and uh, there's also areas uh, where maybe other people are miles ahead of what's going on here. So in the end, I think not one size fits all. In the end, you have to identify what's best for here. Uh, but I would highly recommend to also be open-minded uh, and not only do the interaction locally, uh, to do this beyond the state, nationwide, and ultimately globally, because all these issues we talk about today, they are global problems. Uh, uh, so if we say, literally, we have enough food, that's true, but we have a logistic distribution problem. Mm. So how can we solve that, for example? Or how can we learn from traditional oriental medicine, uh, literally looking back, what they already found 6,000 years ago, or the first um, compound to treat uh, uh, plant diseases was an extract from neem tree. How can we basically get a hold of this information by interacting and communicating with these uh, uh, organizations or these people uh, and also give something back to them and then basically bring this to commercialization? Uh, so not only looking forward with a very, very advanced technology, but also learning from the past and from the wealth of knowledge. And if you just look, very limited has been documented or put in, uh, let's say, in databases. And I was just reading on the flight last night over here from Germany that the Senckenberg Museum, which is maybe the Smithsonian equivalent in Frankfurt uh, in Germany, they have put out now a digital uh, program to catalog literally all the animals, all the organisms out there, and literally uh, combining this with DNA probes so that ultimately if you find something interesting, you would have the access to the genetic information. And I assume that this is going on in multiple countries. And how can we get these people to talk to each other, to help each other and synergize? Uh, again, I would occur, encourage questions. Um, I haven't seen any come in on Twitter. Does, if there's anybody that has questions, please feel free to, to step forward to, to the microphones. This is a pretty friendly group. So uh, <laughs> any question, I think, uh, is fair game uh, to, to, to this group. So talk a little bit about um, uh, many, uh, Beth did an excellent job of identifying that there's lots of students uh, attending today's session. What advice would you give to the next generation of your uh, colleagues that are going to you know, take your seat one day uh, in terms of thinking about future innovation 10, 15, 20 years from now? Um, so uh, be curious. Um, I think the, uh, all innovation comes from somebody asking a question that hasn't been asked or answered before. And so, uh, and the only way we do that is just the motivation to be curious and ask questions. I think um, from a policy educational standpoint, I, you know, I think I love, as a scientist, I'm a chemist by training originally, so I fall into the STEM category. Mm -hmm. I think we've overlooked one, one letter of the alphabet when we put STEM together, and that's ag or animal. 
probably animal from my perspective, but ag. So maybe STEM becomes STEAM, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and we try to heat this thing up a little bit. But um, I, I'm excited by people moving into this space. I can see a lot of the next generation that cares about things fundamentally like sustainability actually being able to do something about it with their education yeah. and their and their pro and their um, vocation going forward. So I just encourage yeah. you guys to to continue the path, but be curious. Ali. If I could just add to that, um, I think what the uh, new generation, the biggest challenge is they have access to so much information, it's easy to be distracted. Um, how to combine this uh, huge resource we have that you can at any moment, anything you don't know, you just Google it. And uh, with the certain focus that is needed to have an impact, uh, that's I think something that we need to learn and the, our kind of newer generation need to um, to put some time, so patience, I think, is important. Um, yeah. We have become more and more impatient. Yeah. Reiner? Uh, I would highly recommend the students to move forward and to approach the people, the opinion leaders in the field, directly uh, go forward. Uh, don't be afraid of any boundaries, uh, also of different technologies, so if you're a computer nerd, uh, be open to go into other areas and you will be surprised how open these people will be to talk to you and to help you uh, and to move you forward in your career. Uh, I personally think we should also start earlier, not only at the university. So I had even programs back in Germany where I went into the kindergarten and had programs with the kindergarten uh, pupils because this is, I think, where you need to capture it. But then also we need to stay more in touch with the people. I think we don't do enough there. So I think it goes both ways, uh, but please don't be afraid. And I just came back, I just graduated my 123rd um, uh, PhD student uh, last uh, Thursday. And it's the first one ever that I had that got a dual degree, now the second degree and the second one, the first one was in biological sciences and the second one was in engineering sciences and he did great. And he is one of these guys that was not afraid of crossing borders and different technologies and he will have a great career. Yeah. Monica? So just not to repeat again, but definitely um, be courteous, be bold, and, and don't be afraid of um, going into engineering, in science, and into any of these uh, technical degrees, because science is cool. You know, you can see we are cool guys, <laughs> and we have done, <laughs> we have all done uh, kind of technical science uh, engineering degree. I have done an engineering degree, and, uh, and I really enjoy every day of what I do, because there's a purpose, there is a there is, a, there is a vision of what we are trying to do and, and food and agriculture and, and, and feeding people around the world is something that really motivates us. So yeah. really think about those kind of, kind of things when you are thinking about the future. But cannot agree more with you, Reiner, is we gotta start earlier. We gotta tell our story better. Mm -hmm. And we have done, I think, maybe to do a little bit of a, a kind of self-criticism, we have not done good enough job telling the story about science, technology, and what it means and what it does for and society. we got a question that came in. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Tyler, final thought just on yeah, advice? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I think that there, um, and I've been very engaged with uh, a number of universities and have partnerships with universities and, um, and work a lot with students. Um, I think the biggest problem that I see is that um, they stop at theory. So they take a class, they take a machine learning class, they take a linear algebra class, and they memorize the theorems and they, they pass their tests, but they, they don't step into applications. And what I would encourage any student is to find, you know, find problems that you can try to apply things as early as possible. Don't wait for an internship, don't wait to graduate, like look for real world applications, because that's what motivates learning and that's what motivates retention. Well, and I think in this area in particular, everything yeah. that we've talked about, there's just so many opportunities. It's a, it's a problem-rich environment, yeah. uh, and that's where innovation is going to occur at, at all levels. So we have a question here in the front. The question I have is we've had some really great ideas put out here today, but if you read popular press, we can't get people to accept GMO or CRISPR or a lot yeah. of other things, and it's like we want our cell phones and the latest, greatest technology there, but we want to go back to Mom and Paul Kettle on our food. <coughs> and we're looking at slower breeds of chickens, not more productive breeds of chickens. We're doing a lot of things that are pushing us back, not forward. And how do we, ad as an industry, address that? Because I think that's, if we don't have the social credentials to proceed forward, it doesn't matter what kind of technology we're putting out here. Monica, you want to take that one first? Yeah, so I, I knew this one was coming, <laughs> this question, because you're absolutely right. Uh, and it's a very difficult to 
answer question. But so instead of focusing on like the problem that we have, uh, it's like trying to find what, what, what we can do different, what, what could be the solution. So a couple of, couple of thoughts here. I think traditionally we thought, well, science is gonna win or technology is going to win. We have demonstrated that that's not the case and we have, you know, we can probably uh, list multiple situations where we realize that science not always wins, unfortunately, but that's the way it is. So, so what can we do to revert that a little bit more? So, so we gotta be more deliberate on uh, advocacy and endorsement strategies and having that embedded on how we bring new technology into the marketplace. Do not wait until you are ready to launch a technology to engage uh, consumers or to engage um, you know, farmers to that matter. I mean, farmers, we will have traditionally uh, involved them early on in the process, but let's think about consumers. We don't involve them in how we develop new technology, or we don't involve them asking them what your needs are, what do you want in your food. We just don't think they are part of the, the chain. And in reality, they are, and they are influencing what, uh, what actually we, you know, farmers uh, produce and so forth. So that will be one area that I think we have to do better is involve consumers earlier on, understanding their needs, bringing them into, bringing them at the table. And when I say consumers, uh, could be the, you know, the Walmarts or, or any other uh, kind of food industry, Kellogg's or any other food industry, bring them at the table, understand their needs and develop new research goals that have in mind uh, those, those, those needs. That will be a way to do it. And then the other way, um, uh, just kind of to have another thought here is what we were mentioning before, tell our story better and start earlier with the STEM education, with programs that we talk about, you know, what, you know, what type of science, what do we do with this science? Because quite frankly, some of this science, we leverage science across different industries, pharma or, uh, or any other uh, medical spaces, and it's the same. So why we have issues in one versus the other and so forth, we have not told our story really well, so we have to do better. And this kind of two thoughts. Reiner, did you have a thought? Uh, I would like maybe to supplement that. Uh, I briefly showed the story about the modified starches. There is a good and a bad story. The bad story is that BASF, a German chemical company, made that in potatoes with a genetic approach and they didn't address the needs or the perception of the consumer. They totally failed, uh, even though they have totally developed this uh, line. And we did exactly the same thing, but without genetic engineering, with a high throughput mutagenesis approach. Uh, and everybody was laughing at us, but in uh, 2010 we introduced the modified line and last year they produced around 20,000 tons of the modified starch, so it's really on the market. So again, by looking into alternatives, you can maybe find the solution, but continue to educate the consumer, very important. Mm -hmm. And just a final comment, uh, the genome editing, in particular CRISPR-Cas, is not considered genetic engineering because you go for point mutations. It is totally deregulated in the US and in uh, Canada, not in all other countries, no. uh, so the Europeans are still seriously discussing it as always. Um, but definitely there could be also solutions with novel technologies uh, if you're only targeting point mutations. Mm -hmm. Question here. So I have a question for Reina. You were actually talking about using plants as medicines. So I kind of found it very curious because I come from India and we have a science called Ayurveda, yep. which is basically using plants for medicines. Mm -hmm. So I had a question for you that, are there any regulating bodies in the United States that regulate growing plants for medicines? And how do we like take out the hippie stereotype of like using plants for medical purposes? Well, I don't know the US reg regulatory framework uh, that well, um, but of course, as long as you comply with good agricultural practices, uh, and uh, as long as the plant doesn't produce something that could be detrimental to people, so they can also make toxins, or if you go, for example, cannabis, and you go for the opiates, so, so you need to clearly regulate that. Uh, so as long as you comply, I think you can do anything you want. The question is only what do you want to cultivate, how do you cultivate that, and just doing it in the field is maybe not the way forward. Uh, you do this in India, and also the Chinese do this very, very extensively, and the rumor goes that people consuming traditional oriental medicine, TCM in particular, that around 100,000 people die per year because they take material that is heavily polluted by heavy metals. So unless you now go and also regulate that and you have a very clear path forward, let's say like in a vertical farm or a total controlled environment where you're cultivating them, maybe even with soil-free artificial substrates uh, where it's right, right now heading, 
then you will have a very well-defined starting material with no additional pollution, uh, and then it's a matter of the extraction and then the purification and the regulatory approval. Question here? And this, this is for Heron and or Monica. Um, you know, food today in the U.S. is relatively inexpensive, and other countries would like to have that same economic model. Um, how do you think about developing new products and still keeping the consumer's costs low? Yeah, thanks, John. Um, well, obviously, you know, we, have, we as a business have to have a value proposition for the food producer uh, to use our products. And so ultimately, it translates back to what does it take to actually bear the risk of, of creating those products and ultimately our cost of production so that they can put them into their systems. That, that economic cycle, that, that um, cycle is very well um, in our minds as we approach our entire R&D portfolio. So it does us no good to actually produce a technology that will solve a problem if we can't um, put it, uh, make it available to them in a way that fits into their economic system. And so um, reducing our cost base, being as efficient as possible is one lever, but the other is demonstrating the value proposition for how this changes their economics when they use it, right? The, the, they, they may have to f um, use fewer animals to get the same amount of meat. They may actually avoid culling herds uh, and those kinds of things. So we, we at um, Alanco have a, a program called Alanco Knowledge Systems where we offer to the customer um, analytical support for how the uh, use of our products and other, other practices will actually improve the economic condition of their operation. And ultimately, that'll drive to the lowest um, economic burden for anybody involved in the system. Yeah, so very, very, very similar. Uh, maybe I will just add that we are working on technologies where with the same input, you can increase the level of content of oil or protein. So, you know, same input, but more, more output uh, to really kind of win on that efficiency and productivity for the farmer. But very important challenge that we take that into account very early on in our kind of discovery process that we will do that research, we will start our program, if the entire value change will really, will really make sense. But excellent question. So the Madam Chairman has given me one more question. So here at the front microphone. Hello. You say that nature is extremely powerful and it's always winning. So rather than racing it, how can we stimulate the power that nature and technology have without limiting biodiversity and the natural progression. Brian, are you going to I guess that's addressed to me. <laughs> well, it's a smart discovery program um, to identify them. Um, let's say the starting material that has this valuable compound. And as I said, uh, I think you can embark a lot on the wealthy knowledge or wealth of knowledge uh, of endogenous healers uh, and go down that path. But then it's not about just only cultivating the plant. You literally basically take either out the features and make it in a recombinant approach. Or if you cultivate it, then you don't do this locally, then you will literally go into greenhouses. So you cultivate, you optimize the plant so that you get higher yield, uh, maybe even better features. The same thing also for the extraction for the compounds. So I'd like to thank our panelists, invite Beth back up here, but as you can see, I, th I think uh, this is just a reflection of the resource and talent uh, going back to that. I do believe that Indiana is truly one of the leading uh, ag, animal, human health, biosciences communities, and it's people like this that are in our own backyard working in companies that are leaders in you know, everything that they do with a very, with a you know, uh, focus on innovation. And so uh, if you please, a warm round of applause for our panelists today, thank you. thank you. You can go ahead and stay for just one sec because this will just take me a minute. Um, again, thank you very much to all of you for being a part of this. and. And I especially want to make sure I point out, and you think about this for our remaining sessions today, and, and Reiner, uh, I think, made the point very aptly, it's very important for us to be really proud of what we already have. Um, but it's also important to be honest with ourselves about where we can take ideas, leapfrog, uh, maybe even copy on occasion uh, some leadership opportunities that other states, other regions, other parts of the world, and maybe it's more about collaboration with some of those places than it is actually trying to compete with them. So be thinking about that because that is critically important to Agronovus as we think about where these advancement and leadership opportunities are to be not only visionary and competitive, but to be also realistic and practical about what we do 
have here. Okay, so it's time for lunch. Um, and as many of you know me, uh, I tend not to give a lot of breaks, and I don't really ever tend to slow down the pace of the program. So here's what you need to do for me. Um, we have boxed lunches for everybody, very nice, uh, multiple options. They're all set up, all ready for you out in the hallway. So I'm gonna need everybody to go out very efficiently, very quickly, make your choice. Don't dilly-dally around turkey, roast beef, and the vegetarian option, but be decisive. Come back in, and I'd like to ask you, we went a little over, so I'd like to ask you to be back here by 1220, okay? 1220 and in your seats, and then that way we can get started with our luncheon keynote, Eric Weiner. And I know we have some folks who have come in in the back of the room. There are some open seats up here in the front, three, four tables. So please make sure that you don't stay standing for lunch and you find a seat and we'll get started at 1220 sharp, okay? We're adjourned.